you for your support in today's presentation. So as, uh, as I said, uh, I'm Steve Shaw. I'm the Executive Officer uh, for S Facility Services, Sustainability and Planning at the TDSB. Uh, it's a role that I uh, moved into back in September of this year uh, with the retirement of our previous Associate Director, Angelos Bacopoulos. So I'm new to this job, but not new to education. I've been with uh, TDSB and a previous board that made up the TDSB for a lot longer than I'd like to admit. Um, and I'm getting closer to the end of my career than the beginning of my career. So what I wanted to talk about uh, is sort of the nuts and bolts of uh, where we are, why we're in the position that we're in. This up a little bit. And let's see if I can get this to go. Okay. So in terms of the TDSB, we are the largest school board in Canada. We uh, are, I think, fourth or fifth in North America. Um, we are made up of about 245,000 students. 35,000 staff members. We have 583 operating schools in 547 buildings, which is about 11% of the total schools in the province of Ontario. We have 73 buildings that we use for non-school, non-instructional uh, purposes, admin buildings, um, adult ed centers, outdoor ed centers, those kinds of things. Um, and it takes up about 46 million square feet of space, about 5,300 acres of land, our average age of our buildings is 62 years old, and our total board budget is $3.3 billion. It's a lot of money, but it's a very, very large organization. Of the 35,000 staff members, we have about 2,200 full-time equivalent caretaking staff that are here on a day-to-day -day basis cleaning the schools. We have about 600 full-time equivalent trade staff that perform maintenance work at our locations. Um, and then we have a very small but dedicated group of management staff in the facilities world that, that manages that whole process. So, getting into the nuts and bolts. Uh, do I point it that way? That way? Some way? Yep. No? Ah, there we go. So, how is the renewal backlog calculated? Because you've, you've already heard this morning with uh, Councillor Matlow that we actually, it's not between 3.5 billion and 4 billion. Our backlog right now is 4.05 billion dollars and growing. And how is that calculated? Well, the Ministry of Education um, does a, an annual review of a certain number of buildings every year. 20% uh, of our building stock is uh, evaluated by the Ministry through a group called Acruent. Uh, they go through the building and they assess all of the major building components in the building uh, and they come up with a, you know, a list of all of the work. They categorize it uh, in terms of its severity and its urgency. Um, and so every one of our schools is evaluated every five years. And I have... Trouble. I, I apologize, you won't be able to read this, but this is from our most recent um, survey results, and this is where you'll see the 4.50 billion. Uh, it's made up of, in, in the first column is urgent priority, second is high priority, third is medium priority, and the fourth column uh, is low priority. And that's where we come to the numbers, you add them all up, you go by component on this side, and you see, for example, uh, Roofing, we have $80 million in urgent priorities for roofing, $44 million in high priority for roofing. So that's a very significant uh, amount of money, and uh, we'll talk about um, how we actually get that addressed. Okay, so as I said, $4.05 billion based on the latest validation. So just after we amalgamated 20 years ago, it's hard to believe it was 20 years ago we amalgamated into the TDSB, but we were receiving about $45 million a year for renewal to do all of the work that we needed to do to keep our schools in a state of good repair. That increased over time slightly. In uh, 04, 05, they introduced good places to learn. Uh, that helped us a little bit, but it still didn't come anywhere close to meeting uh, our needs. In uh, this current budget year, uh, we have $298 million in uh, various pots of money for renewal. Um, <clears throat> and while we're appreciative of all those increases over time, the reality is even at $298 million, 
we're barely able to keep up with uh, the work that we need to do and our backlog continues to grow. And really what we're looking for is a consistent stream of money in order to be able to plan our work more effectively. The way our money comes to us, it comes through the Grants for Student Need process, which is an annual event where the government looks at um, you know, what's available for them and what they're going to fund in each area. Education goes through that and we have pots of money that are set aside for us in, in terms of doing uh, particular work. Our issue is that <clears throat> that money changes from year to year. So for example, this year we have 298 million. Um, we already know that next year it'll probably be a bit less because that 298 million included 50 million dollars in a a budget line called greenhouse gas reduction funds. Uh, we got 50 million dollars out of that last year and it was to address uh, work around greenhouse gas reduction. This year that money has been cut in half and so we expect that our allocation of that will also be cut in half. So we'll see a, a, a net decrease in, in that. So again, consistent funding is important to us. So how do we compare to other, uh, to other boards? So if you look at other boards, and, and we looked at a survey um, reversing the cycle of deterioration uh, in the nation's public schools, an American publication, uh, to get these American numbers. The, the backlog for the average American school is about uh, 4,883. 4, uh, 4, At the TDSB, it's 16,000 per student, and the average in other uh, school boards around the province is about 62. And the average age of buildings, again, in the U.S., the average age of buildings uh, in the study were, is around 40. For us, it's 62. The average age uh, in the province of Ontario is 38. And that, uh, that shows that the TDSB has some real significant challenges. So as I indicated, um, in 1718, we got 298 million. Um, 201 of it was in a fund called School Condition Improvement Funding. Uh, that comes with a few strings to it. 70% of the money has to be uh, spent on accessing major building components and systems. And 30% or roughly 60 million can be used to address local, uh, locally identified issues. But they all have to be things that are captured within the accruent database. Um, we have our standard 47 million now uh, renewal uh, grant, which is uh, probably the least encumbered uh, amount of money we can use it on all sorts of renewal kinds of work. It's not specifically targeted to particular things. Uh, and then, as I said, uh, we had 50 million in greenhouse gas, which we know or we expect will be uh, halved for the upcoming year. So, you know, when, when we look at right-sizing our funding, industry standards suggest somewhere between two and four percent of your replacement value should be spent on an annual basis in terms of, of the state of good repair of your schools. If we just look at our buildings and we look at how the, the um, education ministry would fund a replacement build, they would not typically fund a building. So for example, this building, if, if we suffered a total loss in this building, um, I don't know, uh, uh, earthquake or something like that, total loss, we needed to rebuild this building. The ministry would not fund to replace this building the way it sits today. Instead, what the ministry would look at is they would look at what's our projected student enrollment, what's, what's the yield there, and then we would be forced to build a building to meet those requirements and not the actual replacement. So when you look at that, our, our replacement value using EDU figures is about $7.4 billion. So if you take the midpoint, 3%, our spending to just stay at a state of good repair should be somewhere around $222 million. Um, and as we heard earlier, the, the ministry uh, estimates that it needs $1.4 billion a year to maintain schools in good repair. But according, as the Auditor General says, over the last few years, that number has varied between 150 and 500 million. So I know at this point in time, the ministry, I think there's about a billion dollars has been approved for uh, renewal. So we're not quite to the 1.4, but you know, we're, we're, we're climbing and we're getting hopefully a little bit better. So one last little slide I wanted to, uh, oh, sorry, I have something different here. <laughs> My pause. So when I look at critical issues for us as an organization, when we look at roofing, uh, that's one of our big issues, you know, where we get leaks and other kinds of things. Uh, we believe that 29% of our portfolio 
is urgently in need of repair. So almost a third of our roofs are in urgent need of repair. And that's going to cost us somewhere in the vicinity of $30 million a year for at least the next four to five years. On top of what we've spent to date, and we've had a very aggressive roofing program over the last couple of years. We roof all year round, much to the dismay of, of schools and communities. Um, but we have to do that in order to be able to get all of the work done that needs to be done. Uh, another big critical issue for us is heating plants. We have about 130 schools that have old steam boiler systems. Um, steam boiler systems have a number of complications to them, not the least of which is it requires staff with specialized training and certification, which isn't really offered anymore. And so we're drawing on a smaller and smaller cadre of people to be able to run those plants. Most of those buildings have exceeded their life cycle, most of them by at least 25 years, and they, they're in dire need of replacement. The last couple of years, we've done some uh, replacements of steam plants, so not only the boiler systems, but all of the distribution piping that goes within the system, uh, and that's in, depending on the size of the school, anywhere between two to three billion, uh, two to three million, sorry, uh, per school. And at our existing rate that we've sort of set aside for steam plant replacements, it's going to take us about 35 years to replace all of those, which is far, far too long. So I talked about SCI, which is the School Condition Improvement Funding. It's allocated to major components, and this is how we've you know, typically looked at ours. Uh, roofing, structural brickwork is around 30 million, mechanical, including boilers, uh, not just the steam plants, but all mechanical systems, 65. Window replacements, we have lots of windows in our system. Their frames are wooden windows, and they're leaky, and they're single pane, and they're not energy efficient. Uh, so we're looking at upgrades. We also have cluster column work and other things that needs to be done. Uh, our electrical system upgrades, and then we always have unplanned things that happen. You weren't expecting that this particular component was going to fail, and it actually did fail. Then we, we take that second piece, which is not the major components, but it's um, funds that we're allowed to look at locally identified needs. And so we're looking at things like barrier-free. And so when I look at this stage as an example, this is sort of our barrier-free access to the stage. It's a, a jury-rigged ramp that was put in you know, years ago. You know, this is not really what we'd like to see in our buildings. We'd like to see accessible buildings. We'd like to see lifts and things like that in place so that we're not putting things in place that are temporary in nature. <clears throat> we're looking at parking lots. You know, for years, when we were in those lean years of funding, we, we looked at what was important to do and what was sort of not so important, and parking lots um, were one of those things where we said, you know what, we need to focus on the important things so we can leave the parking lots. Well, now we've gotten to the point where we've got deteriorated parking lots and there's lots of work that needs to be done to bring them up to, to a state of good repair. Field restoration, our fields are in intensively used by students. Uh, we Community use, um, you know, our, all of our fields are available for permitting. They see extensive use on evenings and, and weekends for soccer groups and, and other community organizations, and they take a beating. And so we have to have a program in place to make sure that they actually have grass on them and that they're not just mud bowls. Uh, we're looking at interior work that needs to be done. Uh, we're, we're looking at outside work, fascia, and then also painting, because painting was another area that when we were in those lean years, the decision was made, you know what, painting is more of an aesthetic, so we'll, we'll let painting go. We're now recognizing, or we have been for the last few years, that you know, the condition and the, the way a school looks is really important to kids, and so we want to make sure that we do what we have to do in order to make the buildings as, as uh, attractive as we can for, for kids. Then we have our school uh, renewal needs. As I said, it's sort of the least encumbered uh, fund that we have, um, but we, we do spend the vast majority of on it on small projects in order to extend the life of building components. So we go in, we make repairs. Um, where we think we really should replace something, but we can't afford to replace it, we'll, we'll fix it and we'll make it good for the next two or three years to get us to a point where we can actually replace it. Um, so we do a lot of work there. and. You know, in many cases, we, we believe that that's sort of throwing good money after bad, but it's what we need to do in order to be able to make sure that the, that the building is operational. Uh, health and safety um, uh, is another area, emergencies, so things come up, and health and safety kinds of things. 
uh, arise and they must be addressed and so we, we spend a significant bit of money on that. And then we have some administrative costs because of our, the way the funding model works, a lot of our um, management staff in the design, construction and maintenance world are charged off to projects and those kinds of things and so there's some uh, admin costs that are associated with that. And when you look at renewal, uh, health and safety is prioritized, so when we have a health and safety concern, those are the first kinds of things that we address. Other work is uh, prioritized based on condition, based on the site evaluation, and more importantly, based on available funding. And that $4 billion backlog is not really due to a lack of attention by us, but rather by a lack of appropriate and consistent funding to be able to address all of those needs. Moving on, we, we also have, as I said, uh, minor maintenance. So there's another fund of money that comes to the board. It's the school operations grant. And that fund covers off things like caretaking maintenance and utility costs for the board. And so minor maintenance, which is the day-to-day the -day fixing of things and touching up painting and all those kinds of things, um, is done by in-house staff or by contractors. We're kind of unique in the province of Ontario. We are a, a, the only school board in the province that is a construction employer. Uh, and we are required to utilize unionized workers or contractors for all of the work uh, that's done, unless it you know, exceeds the fair wage cap, in which case we pay fair wage. Uh, we have about 500 trade staff uh, that just do day-to-day -day minor maintenance kinds of work. Last year, they completed 117,000 work orders you know, anything from a plug toilet to, uh, you know, a leaky, a leaky pipe, those kinds of things. Most of the work that they do is reactive in nature. We have very little ability to do preventive or predictive kinds of maintenance. We do reactive work. We fix what's broken. Um, we prioritize the work. It's an electronic system. Caretaking staff on site create notifications to get work done. It's prioritized into one of three categories, emergency, which we try and get somebody there within a two-hour window to deal with the initial issue and you know, not necessarily resolve it, but to actually start res uh, working on it. Uh, urgent, which is a five-day response time, and then routine, which is a 30-working-day response time to do day-to-day -day, uh, things that aren't urgent and aren't going to impact the ability of the school to, to open. In terms of capital construction, um, in addition to our maintenance and our renewal, we do have a, a significant capital program. We currently have several capital projects underway, which um, you know, a couple of them I think we're bringing on stream in uh, September. Uh, we have one new elementary school. It's a joint use project with uh, the city and the Catholic board just sort of west of the Sky Dome. We have two replacement elementary schools that are coming online hopefully in September. And we have one replacement secondary school. And, you know, uh, what's been sort of approved for us on the books uh, is about 25 childcare additions, six school additions, two other replacement elementary schools, and one other replacement secondary school. So a fairly robust uh, capital construction programs, uh, program. So in terms of our uh, decisions whether we repair, replace, renovate, or close the school, it's based really on a number of factors. You know, First and foremost, we look at underutilization or redundancies geographically. So if we have an area where we've got under-enrolled schools and we've got lots of capacity, that is one factor we consider. We deal with a student accommodation pressure. So as, as Councillor um, Atlow talked about in the Davisville area, there's huge accommodation pressures there. Uh, so that factors into it. The ability of the building to meet current program and future program needs and then whether or not the building is what we would consider to be prohibitive to repair. This process includes public consultation. Our planning staff work with communities in order to um, work to solutions that work for the community. Um, and in addition, all of these kinds of things, additions, major renovations and replacements, require us to put together a business case and submit it to the Ministry of Education for approval. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. And that's all I have. I'm not sure if we're going to do questions or whether Chris is going to come up and we can do them after. Um, we have a little time for questions. Um, um, yeah, well, why don't we, why don't we like take <coughs> specific questions to you and we'll do them maybe for 10 minutes and then Chris mm -hmm. can come up. Okay. Yeah. Here? Yeah. Yes. 
it's, it's easy to be so sympathetic to your needs, but I do remember a couple of years ago the headline in the Toronto Star about how costly it was to install a, a, a pencil sharpener. So I'm just wondering if uh, you have any comments about uh, the way your money is being used. So what I'll say about that is um, if you've ever had to do anything at home, and so uh, I'll give you an example. I had a problem with my fridge. I had to call somebody to come and fix my fridge. They charged me $100 to come to my house. They fixed my fridge. They charged me to fix my fridge over and above the service call to come out. We have an infrastructure in place where we charge not only the trade's labor, but all of the overhead that's associated with that to each individual work order or to each individual project. So when you look at a $143 pencil sharpener, absolutely, uh, the optics of that are really, really bad. But if you consider that you had a skilled trades person who makes you know, whatever they make, they have a vehicle and there's stock in the vehicle, there's overhead related to the work order system, to the, the management team, to the supervision, um, those things get added up and in form of transparency, we capture all of those costs and we're very upfront. We publish all of our, um, all of our work orders. Um, it's an annual process, it's out there. Anybody wants to look at what it costs to do something, it's there. Uh, you know, we're not trying to hide it, but it does cost money uh, to do it. Um, can we do things more efficient, efficiently? Absolutely, and we've put a number of things in place in order to do that. Um, one of the things we look at now is we bundle work, and so we make sure that when a tradesperson comes to do that pencil sharpener, uh, which hopefully they're never doing a pencil sharpener ever again, but when they come to a school to do something, that they're also there doing other things as well. So we're bundling the work so that as they come in, they're there, they do four or five different things, and then they leave. And so we can sort of spread that overhead cost out over four or five work orders and making sure that things get done. The second thing that we did, um, we have the ability under the two collective agreements, because we have the Skilled Trades Council, which is, which is our union for our trade staff, and we have QP, which is the union for our custodial staff. We have an agreement between those two that caretaking staff can do what we call minor maintenance. Uh, so things like a pencil sharpener, hanging pictures, um, you know, minor kinds of work caretaking staff on site can do. And so there's been a real push to make sure that if those notifications come in for things like a pencil sharpener, that that gets pushed back to the on-site staff to say, no, you're going to have to do that work. We made sure we trained all of those custodial staff to do that kind of work, and the expectation is that they'll do it. So that's how we're trying to address a lot of those things. Yes, Kathy? I, I, I've got, I'll, I'll defer to Jeff's question, then I have a question. Jeff? Uh, you mentioned the five-year of your capital. You've done county of so accruent is a, a company that's been engaged by the Ministry of Education and they are responsible for the database uh, that looks at the condition of all of the major components within a building and they're responsible for the database for every single school board in the province and they coordinate uh, the inspections, as I say, every year 20% of every school uh, in the province is inspected. That information is uploaded into the database and then that formulates the new, um, the new numbers. And so that's why you see when we were at 3.7 or 3.5, you know, the numbers change from year to year. It's because the new numbers have come in and we've updated the results accordingly. But they are um, engaged by the Ministry of Education. It's a complete third-party solution. It's not a TDSB, which is good for us because sometimes when you put numbers out there that you've developed, people think that there's a bit of a bias there. Um, but in this particular case, it's a third party. And you know we're quite transparent about it and say the results are what the results are. Hi, Steve. Uh, Alex Pasekovic from The Globe. Um, without getting too far into the weeds, um, obviously you are facing some pretty considerable uh, obstacles. Uh, but I wonder if we can look at this one, the one particular example that uh, Josh Matlow brought up of the Davisville School. Let me just put this to you in simple terms. The board had tried to, had looked at that building and found that it was, if I understand correctly, 
not viable to renovate and expand on that building to meet current needs. Are you confident that in the end, less money, it is going to be more cost effective to have torn this building down and replaced it than it would have been to renovate it and expand it to meet the board's requirements? So, I don't want to second guess decisions that were made prior to, to my arrival, but I will say that I have every confidence in our staff and in the business case that was submitted that this was the most effective and the, and the best solution for student accommodation on that site. It's a very small site. The building itself had some issues that, uh, you know, as, as Councilor Matlow pointed out, it had some issues around um, how it was originally designed. And, you know, when we submit the business case, the ministry ultimately approves what's out there uh, based on what comes forward. And, and I do believe that this will be the best solution for student accommodation. Uh, I, I, I don't know what, the, as I say, prior to September I wasn't there. I wasn't part of that decision making process, but I will stand by what was done by what staff have put forward as the most beneficial solution for kids. Uh, in terms of the boilers, do, when you replace them, do you do them under like sort of replace service contracts for the light? Time. Like we're building a uh, you know, subway LRT on Eglinton, which is done under a, they're going to build it, they're going to maintain it for the life cycle of the thing. So I'm assuming if you replace the boiler, you should have a company come in and replace the boiler, maintain and service it for the lifetime of the boiler. You can even spread the costs over a longer time period that way because you're not paying for the initial capital costs since the company is doing the whole thing. Do you use that model at all in terms of roofing, window replacement, or uh, boiler replacement? Thank you. So the short answer is no. Um, the, the procurement process that this board and every other board in the province uses is that we identify work, as you saw that big chart. We have a project, that project goes out to tender, and then the tender comes back, we award to hopefully the low bid based on all of the criteria being met and then that work is done. The issue around um, doing the work following up, it comes out of a different operating budget, so it comes out of that school operations grant, and it isn't, you, you can't capitalize it. So there are issues around that, but more importantly, you have collective agreements in place where work has to be done by the group that represents the people to do that work. And so in the particular case of a boiler, for example, the Skilled Trades Council has jurisdiction for that work, and the Skilled Trades Council would, uh, their, their workers, or an affiliate um, unionized contractor would um, be the, the group that would have to do that work. Okay, I, I, I have a question. Uh, it's to do with the, uh, the funding formula and prohibitive to repair. Uh, my understanding of, of, of the way prohibitive repair is administered, and I, and I may not be correct here, is that schools are, are assessed, and if the cost to repair is roughly equivalent to the cost to replace, the scales tip in favor of replacement. Um, that may or may not be correct, so if you would explain that. Uh, but the, the question is, of course, course relates, relates back, back to the, the massive back maintenance backlog, and how is that going to affect, you know, is that going to accelerate re replacement with that particular funding form? So, the prohibitive to repair really is, um, it's an assessment that's made to determine what's the best approach. So, for example, uh, if you had a school where we would have to spend $13 million to do repairs to get it to the state of good repair to meet the needs but you could build it for 12. The ministry business case would be submitted and the ministry would more than likely say you, you need to look at the most cost effective way which is the replacement. The downside to you know doing those extensive renovations is that sometimes you're left with a building that doesn't necessarily meet all of the needs of the students. Um, you know smaller spaces, um, don't necessarily have the same kinds of facilities, uh, those kinds of things. That's not to say that we don't look at, you know, things like architectural heritage and other things when we're, we're, we're doing this kind of thing, and where we can try to preserve some of those things, but it has to fit, A, the needs of the students, and B, the funding that's available to us. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. I think we'll we'll close there. I think we, we could keep you on, on, on this here all day. Um, I think so. <laughs>